Welcome back, respected guests, ladies and gentlemen. Time fly and we are approaching the final session of the day. I hope you have enjoyed the conference so far. And in session five, we switch our focus on climate change and how companies can become climate ready and transparent. I am speaking with great delight to introduce Ms. Sophie Punte, Managing Director of Policy of We Mean Business Coalition as our final keynote speaker. She's telling us how to make your business climate ready and now, let's welcome Ms. Punte. Good morning, Hong Kong, or good afternoon for you. Uh, my name is Sophie Punte. I'm speaking to you from Amsterdam, the Netherlands. And I would like to explain to you a little bit about how can you make your company climate ready. Um, I prepared a number of slides. So um, when to make your business climate ready, I've, at the We Mean Business Coalition, we have worked on this topic for quite some years. And let me uh, go to the next slide to show you what the We Mean Business Coalition is. The We Mean Business Coalition was set up in 2014 um, as a coalition of seven business networks and organizations, all working with businesses to advance um, sustainable practices, in particularly focusing on climate change. So we're looking to work with the world's most influential companies to take action and we do this by getting companies to get, take more action and use that to give confidence or advocate with, advocate with governments for change. And as a result, we get more policy ambition. And that again leads to more companies taking action. So in addition to the seven organizations that you see listed here, we have also an extensive network of partners, such as Science-Based Startups, Mission Possible Partnership, and Race to Zero. And uh, the Hong Kong uh, Business Environment Council, of course, also one of our partners, particularly through the World Business Council of Sustainable Development. So let me explain then what we mean with climate leadership. Next slide, please. So we've published a report a year ago called Climate Leadership Now. And it explains in practical terms how companies can become a leader on climate in four steps. First one is ambition, the second one is action, the third one is advocacy, and the fourth one is accountability. And I hope that my slides are shared with all of you so you can download the report for yourself. But let me take you to, through those four steps. Next, please. So the first one is ambition. This is a cover of Time magazine issued um, one month ago, and it is about climate is everything. It links climate change to the corona crisis in two ways. One that we need to, to address in the pandemic needs to consider climate change, but also that what we have seen over the past year of the corona crisis is a little bit of a peak view of what we're going to experience over the next 100 years on climate. It is really critical that we, act, that we set our ambitions higher. When you look at the scenario for 1.5 degrees, so staying, um, having temperatures on the planet stay below that, we have maybe only until 2030 left before a tipping point is reached and we cross that. And because of that, we need everyone, not only companies, but also governments, um, and even you and I as citizens to be more ambitious. So what does that mean in practice? Next slide, please. So the first one is align your targets with science. And what that means is setting science-based targets to hold your um, company's emissions within a 1.5 degrees pathway, ideally. And this is done through the Science-Based Targets Initiative. And we've seen more than, a, than 1,100 companies already committing to, and many of them have also got approved science-based targets by now. The second one is to aim for net zero and have your emissions by 2030. And having emissions is equally important because unless we start having serious action over the coming years, we have a very, big problem, as I just explained. And there's the business ambitions for 1.5, as well as the climate pledge that companies can join. And the third one is factoring in your value chain. Now, all the companies that are also on the panel today have supply chains. They're working with small, small medium enterprises. They have various suppliers um, and also very many customers who they can influence one way or the other. So when you're really a climate leader, you look beyond your own company boundaries and you actually look at how can I address emissions linked in my supply chain or called scope three and developing a strategy for that. 
And there's a report uh, called Climate Action in the Value Chain. And then there's the SME Climate Hub that sm small and medium enterprises can join to commit to similar ambitions as bigger companies. Next, please. Just some examples. We have, as you all are aware of the Race to Zero, uh, the BEC Hong Kong is also contributing to. And we see now 708 cities, 24 regions, more than 2,000 businesses, 163 bigger investors, and 624 higher ed education institutes join. The initiatives listed below are the ones through which companies can join the Race to Zero. So if you commit to or join any of these initiatives, your company can also be registered as part of the Race to Zero campaign that is run by the UNFCCC. Now, the We Mean Business Coalition is particularly focusing on the business ambition for 1.5, in other words, getting companies to align with 1.5 targets, the Climate Pledge um, with Amazon and others, and the SME Climate Hub, as I explained. So this is what you can do. Now let's move on to, once you've got your ambition sorted, what can you do for action? Next, please. Oh, sorry, I've got an example first. An example here is the RE100 run by the Climate Group and CDP. Both of us are partners. And I've looked up that the, the, the companies that stood up first in Korea was SK, in Japan, RICO, um, in China, Ilion, and um, in Taiwan, TCI. So what is important here with ambition is that sometimes stick your neck out, be the first one to commit to something because once a few companies have done that, others will follow. And I commend companies that take this leadership role by wanting to be the first. Another example is Fujitsu. They have set validated science-based target, targets, but they've subsequently aligned them with 1.5 degrees. And what I particularly like about their report is that they've also included an action plan or this graph whereby they explain how are we going to reach this target. So it's more than an ambition, it's actually showing how are we going to get there. But you can also have other targets, like IKEA, for example, requires all customer deliveries and services in their 13 markets to be used, electric vehicles or other zero emission solutions. So you can make your ambitions also more specific to a certain solution. Now let's go to action. Next, please. On the action, um, everybody's probably heard that Larry Fink annually sends a letter to CEOs. And when he sent one a year ago, so this is in 2020, he was saying climate change is going to come higher on the agenda. And this led to Microsoft committing to be carbon negative by 2030, Salesforce committing to restoring 100 billion trees over the next de decade, and Delta Airlines committing to 1 billion uh, investments to become carbon neutral. So that's already quite a lot. This year, he went even further. He said, I want all companies we invest in to close a plan. How are you going to, how are you going to address, address the climate challenge? And of course, that means now that sustainability is indeed the new standard. You cannot get your investments unless you have a plan to deal with climate and broader sustainability issues. Next, please. So what you can do is you can work with various initiatives um, to make sure that your science-based targets are put into practice. And here's a, a number of examples I mentioned here. You can also inform your investors by implementing recommendations by the Task Force on Climate Change Related Financial Disclosures. And this is a set of recommendations that companies can use to inform the investors around strategy, governance, and other issues what are they doing on climate? So in other words, how are they making sure that the investments are climate proof? And the third one is to connect climate to equality and equality. And what this means is that, for example, as you are investing in climate actions, you also think around, okay, if we were, for example, to divest from coal, how are we gonna make sure the workforce is being retrained to do something else? How can we make sure that climate action, for example, if we, uh, help communities get access to, so, to, to alternative energy, but we also help poor people to get access to that. So that you look beyond um, the climate goal, but put it in a broader context of equality and broader sustainable development goals. Next, please. So here is an overview of initiatives, and just, of course, because there's many, many of them, I think there's hundreds of initiatives by now, but if you compare the sectors that are put on the left, and then you've got the race to zero breakthrough. So they've identified a number of sectors whereby they're looking to get companies to commit to ambitions and action. 
And then on the right column, I've listed a number of examples that can help with that. So for example, in energy, you have uh, RE100 and EP100, both run by the climate group and climate group together with CDP. But you've also got ones, for example, for steel. So there's now steel zero and responsible steel that is starting. And within Mission Possible Partnership, you have the net zero steel initiative that brings producers together, where steel zero is going to bring the, the customers together. So very often there's many initiatives, but these are increasingly working together to cover off everyone, the suppliers, as well as the customers, as well as the investors and the governments. Next one, please. So I want to give one example, uh, Signify, which um, used to be part of Philips and is now a specialized lighting company. They, contrib they committed to become carbon neutral and they were able to achieve that for their operations last year. Um, and they done, they've done that by investing in their industry operations, for example, making them more efficient, um, non-industry operations, so allowing people, for example, to work from home, but also to look at lighting. The logistics by using by pref giving preference to carriers that were having a lower carbon footprint than their competitors or trying to reroute um, the, the goods that were being transported and finally the business travel and what we see now i think a lasting effect of corona that people like me did keynote speeches over online instead of flying across the world to be with you although that would have been nice but they continue to be ambitious because they've set the 2030 absolute greenhouse gas emissions goals to reduce 70% from scope one and two and 30% for scope three from the use of sold products. And the reason why they picked this particularly because of course the biggest emissions from lights is when they're used much more from when they're being produced. And you see the same happening in other, other sectors like automotive. Where, where OEMs are saying we're setting targets for the use of our products by consumers and not just for our own operations. So should you have a company that has a products that in doing the use of the products use energy, please set your targets and take action there too. Next please. So let's move on to advocacy. Now advocacy we've seen uh, Biden here signing an order on climate change. This was the one where he was rejoining the Paris Agreement last um, last January, and it speaks for itself. Business, when they set ambition and they want to take action, they can only do so if governments create the environment for them to invest. This is, for example, for banks, like ANZ, who's on the panel, but also for companies who are need to invest in alternative technologies, including all their suppliers. It will only happen if government is behind them too. So next, please. And so the way that you can you can, as a company, engage is make your voice heard by advocating for, for, for policies that are in line with science, but also to call out that if policies are not and saying these are not in line with science, we should get rid of them. Second one is the trade associations, and they, they play a quite important role. You can be a, a leading company, but your trade associations tend to, of course, represent a much broader group of companies. And what you can do as a leading company is pull the floor up. So try and get more companies to within the trade association to uh, become more ambitious too. So here is where you can have an influence on, a, on your broader peers via your trade associations. And the last one then, of course, is influencing the, your peers by joining initiatives where you might meet other companies either like-minded or who might have different experiences. And by doing so, you can exchange, exchange ideas and create a bit of healthy competition amongst you and others to see how can we help each other improve. And of course, BEC Hong Kong is one of them, but there are many more. And some of them are global, like, like BSR World Business Council. Some of them focus specifically on a region, for example, um, in Sirius in the US or the Corporate Leaders Group in Europe or Japan, JCLP is then specifically national. Next, please. Now, the examples I want to give is the ones that um, Bimi Business has been involved with. So last year, um, CLG Europe, our partner for Europe, urged companies to sign a letter, and there were more than 150 of them. And they were asking EU, please adopt 55% emission targets cut by 2030, because science demands it. And we as businesses are willing to invest, but if you set the ambition high, we are willing to invest more. 
And uh, von der Leyen in, this, in her speech when she announced it, she actually mentions this letter explicitly. So that means that business advocacy can have a very positive contribution to policy ambition. The second one is one that many of you will be familiar with. This is the RE100 by Klein Group and CDP. They had a number of companies um, led by the, the JCLP in Japan, urging again the, the, the Japanese government to increase uh, the, emission, the ambition of, of renewables in, and the lead up to the COP26. And they had numerous companies um, of the Japanese members joining them in this call for advocacy. And government, it's, it's about putting pressure on them a little bit, but what is more, it's about often about giving co governments the confidence to take that move. Because if they know businesses are behind it, it becomes so much easier as a political cell, because climate ambition is not always easy to do. It can also be a difficult choice. And so the last one definitely was one of those. We saw at CNN uh, how um, this was an interview with John Kerry. And it was the day after We Mean Business and our partner series in the US had launched a letter um, signed by then 300 companies. In the end, it were more than 400 companies who signed it saying, President Biden, please set your targets at at least 50% by 2030. And if you increase your ambition, we will too. And the success of this one was also because that we worked with World Research Institutes and others to confirm that scientifically this was within the Paris uh, Paris Agreement goals, and it was technically possible. There were the technologies and measures that could be implemented by the US to reach it. So it was ambitious and attainable. Very important to get that confirmed before governments are willing to commit to this. So this was a huge success. Next, please. And then here you see advocacy. This graph shows um, a mapping of companies by the influence map whereby um, on the left, you basically see companies that are um, opposing um, climate action and on the right, they are supporting it. And then you have um, from the, at the bottom, you have the ones who are less involved and at the top are the ones who are very active in advocacy. And this mapping is being used to understand when you look at various companies, how are they? Are they, are they supporting? Are they active? And of course, what you want your company to be in the top right box, right? You want to be in there. Yeah. And um, with that, I want to go to the next one. But you note that the shell, for example, here is at the very top. And the next, next um, item is on accountability. Next, please. So um, being Dutch, of course, I could not escape this core sentence that orders Shell to cut carbon emissions 45% by 2030. It was a major... Um, it was a major court judgment, uh, partly because the shareholders had uh, quite, quite recently approved the, sh the, the Shell's plan, but here the court actually ordered Shell to go further. Now, it signals two things. One is that um, judges are increasingly likely going to um, ask companies to be more active on climate change because they see it as a threat to society. It's not just about business, it's about the whole society that is dependent on what these companies do. But the other thing I want to stress is that it's not that these companies are not doing anything. You know, Shell is investing in alternatives. It's basically what is being asked, do more of it. It is likely going to be a transition and we want the transition to go faster. And we need companies like Shell, but also others to join this. Um, and with that, you can see, for example, in the same week, Exxon had two new board members appointed in their board that were, were nominated by environmental groups for exactly the same reason. We are not going to get real, rid of oil today, but we need to phase it out and we need the help of these companies to make that happen. So accountability here has two, two angles. One, a push, but also one of hope that, that uh, we can um, work with these companies to make that happen. Next, please. So accountability. It's about reporting on progress, so disclosing your emissions and, um, and of course, reporting, are you on track with your targets, right? The second is one about listening, listen and learn. And this is about getting your own staff and your own suppliers and your own management and your own stakeholders involved and understanding what they want. Surveys over and over show when you do staff surveys, young people want to join companies that have a positive influence on society. 
is much more than about money. It's about being proud of who you work for and it's about being proud of what your company you work for does, that they actually contribute to something good in the world. And to do that, um, so listening to especially your younger people is going to be increasingly important to keep good people on in your organization. And the final one is about the executive board to have a, a climate committee. So you can have um, board members who have our climate competence, who know what climate risk means to the company. But you can also have committees that inform the boards to get um, climate action more prominent. And the one example I want to give is B Corp, B Corporation. They actually accept members and those, co those companies that join have to rewrite or include in the articles of the corporation and bylaws that they make climate and sustainability explicit purpose of the company. Next, please. So here's my last example then. I wanted to pick out two um, because this is about how do you do that in your reporting. Now, many companies will already be reporting to CDP and, um, and for example, BEC Hong Kong also has a scheme for Hong Kong-based businesses to set their ambition and take action and then report. So there's reporting that way as well. But these two examples are particularly relating to the annual reports. So the two examples are Credit Suisse. What they've done is they've made an annual report and then they've made a sustainability report underneath that. And as part of the sustainability report, they then have a separate report again on this, this TCFD, so the disclosure of climate-related financial information um, as well. So they've got three, but they are very much linked. The example on the right is, is essentially the same. However, what DSM does is they've made an integrated annual report. So they've only got one report and there's various sections. You find the same information as DSM's report as you find in Credit Suisse. It's just presented differently. What matters is that you as a company tick off all three. Make sure you have your annual report, where there's a clear link with sustainability. It's not on the side. It's really part of your, your organization, of your company's uh, objectives. And then make sure that you have a clear section that ticks off the TCFD recommendations. And by doing that, both the, the broader investors, the investors specifically interested in climate change, and your broader stakeholders will all find the information you need. Next, please. And with that, I want to conclude and say, um, this is me with my son, the two sons. Um, this is my oldest, Menno, and we are together on the damn square a year, year ago, two years ago, when it was before Corona, um, for the climate march in Amsterdam. And this is the banner he made, I want my future back. My motivation to work on this topic is um, to help the future generation, including my own kids, to have a better future. And uh, we need you as companies, and we need particularly companies in Asia to help. Asia is the biggest growth in the economy. It's home to 60% of the world's population. It is already more than 50% of emissions. And unless we have all Asian companies on board, um, we don't have as much chance of success in reaching climate, um, climate neutrality. So with that, next slide, please. Our uh, motto for this COP, for We Mean Business, is all in for 2030. We can talk about net zero emissions by 2050. We need those tar targets, but what matters most is what are we going to do this decade? The size of decade, we need to accelerate action and have our emissions by 2030. I thank very much the organizers and thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Punte, for the thorough sharing on the four steps of climate leadership to make business cl um, climate ready. Please state it for the panel discussion. And just a reminder, later on, if you want to submit questions to our panel of speakers, please use the Q&A box to do so. Now, for the last panel discussion of today's conference, please welcome a moderator, Mr. Simon Ng, Director of Policy and Research of BEC, to lead this plenary. Simon, over to you, please. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to moderate the fifth and the last session of today's conference. So before I start, I would like to thank uh, Sophie for your presentation and sharing, and of course, uh, for staying for the panel discussion. Now joining Sophie today, we have Dr. Raymond Yao, General Manager, Technical Services and Sustainable Development of Soya Properties Limited. And we also have Ms. Ophelia Lin, Managing Director of Mariki Japan Company Limited. Ms. Pratima Divki, 
Director of CDP. And last but not least, Mr. Albert Poon, Senior Manager, EQSH, Kone Elevator Hong Kong Limited. Welcome all to BEC and to this conference. Now, um, Sophie, you started with the contacts with um, you know, your vision about how companies can move forward to become climate ready with four specific steps. Now, I just want to remind the panel, you know, we really want to discuss how to get companies uh, climate ready and transparent. And I know this is not an easy task. It requires um, planning. It requires a lot of support internally and externally. And also, it, it requires a lot of uh, commitment and determination. Now, I would like to start with um, Raymond and Albert, perhaps. Um, can you say a few words about your company and the main business focus, just uh, for the interest of our audience? And also, can you briefly share with us your company's carbon uh, target and also your decarbonization strategy? Um, maybe, Raymond, you can start first. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, BEC, inviting me to this platform. It's great to hear Sophie from Women Business sharing uh, their perspective on uh, raising to zero. Indeed, uh, Swipe Properties is a real estate developer headquartered in Hong Kong, also listed in Hong Kong, with a global asset primarily in Hong Kong and Chinese mainland, and as well as in US and rather lately in South, other parts of Southeast Asia. So, um, and we basically integrate sustainability in almost every facet of our business. But if I start to count, uh, we have a long history of uh, uh, energy reduction or carbon decarbonization, at least for the past uh, two decades. And uh, quite uh, happy to say that at the year of 2020, we achieved in excess of 30% or 21% uh, in terms of energy reduction in both our Hong Kong and Chinese mainland portfolio compared to 2008. But why do I particularly highlight this was because there was the, um, uh, a target set out quite a long time ago for us to achieve. We actually did it. But uh, um, towards the end of uh, 2015, that is a major year when Paris, agree uh, Paris COP21 just been completed in December that year. And uh, in joining Swipe Properties, we begin to look into what is the implication of Paris Agreement to large corporate, in particular to a real estate developer. And since then, we start to pull together a review about what additional or new decarbonization target that the corporate need to uh, come by in the years to come. And so in that year, we started looking into the science-based target that is derived or, or established right after the Paris, uh, sort of the Paris Agreement. So the, in the, um, it took quite a few years for us to pull together all the facts and figures and commitment implications. So, uh, roughly about uh, November 2019, we got our science based target endorsed by the initiative themselves. So, the, but along the two degree trajectory scenario. And uh, over time, roughly about a year later, which is about uh, December last year, 2020, we ramp up the ambition with the support of our chief executive, Mr. Guy Bradley, into uh, looking into the 1.5 degree commitment with this real indeed a very tall order. So we, we are now in the family of raising to zero. But, but uh, having said that is that we haven't quite submitted our full plan, which is roughly we will do it in two, two months time. So, so therefore, uh, uh, this is the critical moment, how we ascertain the precise strategy in helping us to achieve this tall order. So maybe at this juncture, I stop you here. Well, thank, thank you, you. Raymond. Um, well, definitely, we in Hong Kong, we know Swara Properties has been one of the leading um, and front runner in terms of decarbonization and your commitment to SBTI, as well as your other initiatives and strategy. I mean, it's, it's very helpful, not just for your company, of course, but also for your peers, because, I mean, it's a process that we learn from one another. And very obviously, you know, many companies in Hong Kong are looking upon Swara. Uh, to try to you know, uh, you know, get some tips in terms of how to get things done, if I may put that that way. Um, but now, um, other than Swire, we also have other companies in Hong Kong who are doing just the same. 
Now, I would like to introduce um, Albert and Connie. Um, you are, you know, one of uh, BC's council member. Actually, you know, everyone using Connie's services. Thank but, you know, we, maybe we've, we've heard very little about your decarbonization mm -hmm. commitment, but actually mm -hmm. it's a very ambitious target. Yeah. Albert, can you share with us your, your story? Yes, in fact, uh, Connie is from Finland, mm -hmm. and um, we are doing the um, uh, uh, people flow solutions. Uh, by installing and maintaining the living escalators all over the world. And, uh, but recently, we just established our uh, climate pledge and to become carbon neutral in the year 2030. And this is quite ambitious to some extent. And because well, um, um, from the good old days, we simply just got concentrated on the 3%, 4% reductions on the scope 1 and 2, take a system thing. That, but now, uh, the headquarters uh, plan to have a big jumps on this issue. And, uh, um, but it's, it's good because well, we have the support from the headquarters, and that means well, we, are, we are allowed to spend and invest more in the, all the activities uh, related to the decarbonizations. And um, uh, uh, also uh, um, uh, focus on the scope one and two reductions. And then, the, for example, the, um, we recently just purchased some motorcycles uh, powered by the uh, electricity and instead of buying the uh, traditional ones. And this is expensive, but well, it's worth because well, it will pay. It will pay because well, um, for, for especially in the reductions of the uh, scope one's expenses. And uh, we also established the um, uh, steering committees uh, just for three months. It's a bit down, by the way. And um, uh, we just, you know, um, lead the companies to um, the, the projects. And we allocate resources to uh, related projects in order to achieve the, um, the reductions on scope and two. Um, and this is what we approach now. OK. OK, thank you, Albert. It sounds like, you know, um, your headquarters have set a very yeah. ambitious target. And you know, in Hong Kong, in your office, you are now trying to put different systems in place so that you can, you know, step by step achieve those targets. So it's it's like you know, you, you you've got a very you know uh, important target, but but you you have to build up your internal capacity in, yes. in a sense. Mm. So we'll come back to you later uh, to elaborate that point. Um, if I may switch to Ophelia. Ophelia, um, I'd like you to say a few words about your company. Now, um, I think we had a chat before you know, this event because uh, I really want to invite you to share because you, know, you are representing the smaller companies, if I may put it that way, uh, the SMEs, but still with an ambition to become part of this climate solution. And in that process, actually, you've encountered different challenges and you are learning on the way um, so, I mean, it's a fascinating story. Can, can you, first of all, tell us your company, what you are doing, but then more importantly, your decarbonization journey? So, thank you for having me here. Thank you, Simon. So, um, today I come and uh, learning uh, from everybody's experts and professionals here. So, uh, I'm Ophelia from America, Japan. My company was established uh, 24 years ago. Uh, it's been the look, look like a long time. And um, uh, my company is a health uh, company, specialized in um, uh, researching and uh, distributing the health supplement from Japan and also from Sweden. And um, uh, we would like to, to promote or build uh, a happier and healthier community through our a range of products and also our service. Then uh, also we would like to create the share values in Hong Kong. So this is my dream, and uh, we start the company uh, uh, many years ago. And uh, the journey of starting to my the decarbonization plan or a climate action plan is about uh, 15 years ago. So uh, there's a lot of um, people are talking about uh, recycling, um, uh, environmental protections. As a small company. At the time, maybe we have only have maybe 40 people in the company. So uh, we communicate with the colleagues and thinking what we can do to react this uh, social issue or the, the, the planet issues. 
So then we uh, started initiative, the first program, um, to collect or uh, recycling our product boxes and bottles from the retail markets. And uh, it's received a lot of um, a very good response and support from my colleagues and customers. So it's really encouraged us that this is the right way. And, and also it's a create a good reputation of the company. So then we still thinking that uh, uh, we need to do uh, more than I set up the CSR department in the company to take care of all the uh, decarbonization or environmental um, protections issues or projects. And uh, after that, uh, we think uh, the knowledge we are not good enough. Then uh, we joined the local uh, NGO, uh, green organizations, uh, to keep in touch with the latest news and uh, progressively attend some training and workshops to get uh, in touch with the professionals and experts to collect as more as we can from the markets. Because the resources is not enough for us because we don't have uh, expertise in the company. So uh, we try to get in touch with those uh, experts in this way. And uh, then it, we grow a bit uh, bigger then we're thinking um, we can start more program with uh, our customers. So low carbon program, low carbon diet, because we're we are the health sup supplement company. So we have a, a lot of uh, nutritionists. So we can easily to organize a lot of uh, daily like um, low carbon workshops with our customer. So this engage the public and also our consumers. So they, they're getting more uh, loyal to, with our uh, brands. So this is added value to our company also. Then uh, after that, we already have some program very successful. So we uh, were suggested by the local NGO that you should apply some uh, award so uh, to see your standard uh, among those SME. And also we can learn from those uh, uh, big companies that are doing very good so this is a very a good opportunity for us to measure what we are doing uh, for the last few years. Then also we received some recognitions that make us uh, very like um, happy and proud and uh, the, uh, my colleagues also feeling a very sense of belongings that they're, they're thinking they are doing the right things to the community and also they're proud to work in the company. Then uh, until 2018, I thinking that we should um, um, uh, have some improvement because we already have some award recognitions. So can we do better? So um, I was um, taking a, cl a, a class uh, at the uh, uh, University of Cambridge. Uh, the CISL course is the um, is the learning about the sustainability issues. So this course is really uh, empower and inspire me. And uh, it's also giving a, a lot of uh, uh, information and knowledge that I can communicate with the local, maybe the, uh, the NGO and, the, and those experts. I, I feel I can do uh, even better uh, with my knowledge now. So after I come back from Cambridge, I, I set up the um, uh, a sustainability committee internally with my colleagues and invite the department head to join hand together. I think to cultivate the, the talent is important. Uh, uh, together we can make a, a bigger impact to the community. So uh, regarding the support, uh, of the support uh, by my mentors, uh, Professor Lowe from CUHK, and uh, we invite uh, the um, um, might um, um, uh, uh, leaders uh, together, we form the uh, sustainability society. That's make us can uh, have a bigger impact to the society. That's uh, we invite um, the SME who have the uh, ambitions. Uh, they can join hand together. So uh, that is another step. We can not also um, talk to the government about the uh, policy agendas. So it makes us uh, uh, feel more meaningful, not only the uh, I'm the leaders of the company. Now I'm the leaders maybe in the community and also we can uh, dialogue with the uh, uh, government. So this is uh, my journey and uh, uh, the simple is, I start in the simple way and, 
and uh, I'd uh, grow up, I mean, uh, uh, in our experience. So, so this is a little story about that. <laughs> well, thank you, Ophelia. Thank of you. course, of course, um, your company also signed up for the low carbon charter. Yes. And you know, we, we are about to, to, you know, to try and work closer together to help you in your decarbonization journey. Yeah, and in that process, of course, um, we will co-learn with other sanitaries all together. Now, if I may move on to um, uh, Pratima, um, you know, CDP actually has a strong connection with Women Business Coalition. Now, and, and you are a long-term collaborator with BEC, so thank you so much for your support, um, especially uh, with the Low Carbon Charter. Now, I'd like to ask you, Pratima, you know, um, what kind of advice or support um, CDP is actually providing to SMEs in particular? You know, um, I think a few months ago, you invited me to speak in one of the events uh, on SBTI for SMEs, right? So, so I, I think, you know, um, the international community is already paying more attention to support SMEs in decarbonization. Um, can you tell us more about the initiatives that you are you know, putting together uh, in Hong Kong and also in this region? Yeah. No, thank you, Simon. Thanks for the invite today. Um, I think in terms of SMEs, um, you know, when we look at sort of the overall CDP data, and I look at specifically the Asia-Pacific region, the, the thing that comes out more is we have about 3,000 companies in Asia-Pacific today that respond to CDP um, on their various you know, climate resilience um, metrics and targets, as well as you know, how they're embedding that into strategy um, through, the, through the TCFD framework. But um, the, thing to, the thing to note is about 60 to 70% of these 3,000 companies are actually um, in, within the supply chain. So it's essentially you know, large multinationals that are requesting their supply chains to, to respond um, through CDP and then gather that data to engage with these suppliers. Um, and so a, a, you know, the, it, that has taken off a lot faster, I would say, um, as opposed to you know, certain pockets where we've had you know, financial institutions having the influence to, within Asia Pacific for companies to respond to, um, to our questionnaires. So I would say um, you know, where we are sort of seeing SMEs kind of take up some of them are quite voluntary um, because they realize that you know, climate resilience is really in their best interest. You know, we've had um, SMEs kind of respond to us. There's been this uh, logistics company in Bangkok which um, did a, a floodplain um, mapping and, and decided it was much more prudent to move their warehouses more inland. Um, you know, there's, there's been examples of, uh, of that with the, which we're seeing within our uh, responses itself. We've had large companies kind of reach out to their suppliers and say, you know, let's start on this journey. So I realize this, you know, questionnaire is complicated and comprehensive. Can you, um, you know, provide data on these five aspects first? And let's work on these five aspects and then start building it up. Um, and then, of course, you have science-based targets. So um, within Asia Pacific, there's about 265 companies now that have uh, committed to science-based targets, and Sophie just uh, mentioned as well, you know, globally it's about a thousand odd companies. The requirement for, you know, one of these is they need to consider scope three, um, and that's where, you know, engagement with customers, with suppliers comes in. And so we're seeing a lot more engagement coming through that. Uh, we see companies getting a lot more active. You know, uh, one example is, of course, Walmart, which through their project Gigaton and sort of CDP's data kind of feeds into that. Uh, where you know they incentivize suppliers um, on the basis of certain data points, um, in a, which then links to their procurement spend, etc. So these are some of the initiatives that are that's already happening. So uh, I think one is from a policy perspective, one is from actual self-interest that they realize, and then the third is you know where large companies are actually helping and engaging with with small companies already. Um, I think where CDP comes in. Uh, what we have done is we've taken the TCFD framework, which is, uh, which is I think we can now say it's, it's the gold standard globally. So we've taken that framework and we've just standardized it so that if you're a company that has read the TCFD framework but is still you know, a little bit confused on how to start, where to start, what to do, um, we just provide these 14 modules um, and we say, you know, let's take governance and culture, you know, there's, there's X number of questions 
you know, you answer these questions and that sort of feeds in. And for the SMEs, we've made it much simpler. So we've said, you know, we have sort of like a minimum of the question and we tell companies you can just respond to that. Um, what we've also done is for large companies that are supply chain members with us, we generally hold very specific and very targeted capacity webinars, but we also ensure that we bring across what we call as action exchange. So we actually get another supplier you know, coming forward and talking about their journey and how they actually set this up. So there's actually market knowledge that's, that's you know, being exchanged. And then, of course, lastly, is, you know, we've just about set now. Uh, we've got to see how it works, but we set up an online education platform, um, specifically targeting you know, suppliers and sort of getting them understanding more. Um, we're still tweaking it, so I have to say mm. it's yet to come. Um, but that's, that's kind of started. So that's sort of where you know, the, the support has been from our side. Okay, okay, thank you, Pratima. Um, Sophie, I want to you know, ask you a similar question, but you know, at a global level. Are there any global initiatives that support SME to decarbonize and to become climate ready? You know, I ask this because SME are an important part of multinationals' uh, supply chain. So without effort from SME, um, multinationals might not be able to reach their uh, decarbonization target. So, so, you know, anything that you can share from your position uh, with uh, Women Business Coalition? Yes, well, um, as I already explained, we have established, uh, together with the International Chamber of Commerce and others, the SME Climate Hub. And SMEs can join individually to say we want to set targets um, that are in line with science and also set interim targets for 2030. And of course, then the trick is then to see how can those SMEs be supported. Hmm. Now, the nature of SMEs is obviously lo local and small. So what I'm very fascinated to hear is when I hear uh, Fatima um, speak about the, how they work with the SMEs, the next step is very much to link the SME Climate Hub with the various initiatives that exist locally to support them. I want to give an example, for example, from the US. There's a network called SEMI that is um, uniting various companies, including thousands of SMEs in the electronic sector. But you, for example, also have the International Road Transportation Union that is having training courses for SMEs, as well as the organization where I worked previously, Smart Freight Center, that has developed a training course for road freight carriers, SMEs very often, on how to um, become more energy efficient across their fleets. So what, what I'm very interested to learn and hear including for partners like BC Hong Kong, what are the initiatives that already exist, because there must be hundreds of them across the world, and in a way try to set up an exchange between them. So if something in the US exists, maybe it's something that could help Hong Kong or vice versa. Or maybe it's something that a bank that ANZ has developed that might help uh, banks in other parts of the world. So um, my main point, I want to make is that SMEs are local, very sector specific often, and because of that need training and support tailored to their needs. And the only way to do this is by working with local organizations like yourself. And I do think that the SME Climate Hub at a global level can unite the SMEs globally and make sure that the multinationals that are part of Race to Zero or Women Business Supported Initiatives are truly making use of those initiatives to mobilize and support their SMEs instead of setting targets at the corporate level and not being able to really translate that to action on the ground because they, they lose touch with the SMEs they work with. Okay, thank you, Sophie. Um, I agree with you. Um, local organizations like BEC should take the lead and reach out to SMEs and try to support them and help them. Now, Ophelia, I remember in one of our earlier conversations, you, well, actually we learned from you because you told us, you know, um, we need to be careful in terms of how we pitch SME companies when it comes to decarbonization. It's not about compliance. Yeah. It's about something else. And secondly, 
about the language, how we articulate uh, the challenge in a way that would get that buy-in. So can you elaborate a little bit, little bit more? So, you know, what are the drivers that you can see that would mobilize them to go into action and become climate ready? I think uh, first thing is, as I said before, is because there's no standard for, for SME. There's no uh, regulations and uh, uh, there's no requirement, uh, not like us, big corp, you have the, uh, the ESG for followed. Mm. But uh, for SME, they, they can freely, they are, they're thinking that uh, they need to do or um, is that my responsibility? Yeah. Is that the uh, responsibility uh, for the government or the big corp? So this is the first things. And if they really want to do, or they're thinking that, oh, oh maybe I should do, uh, because this is also the global issue, my issue, but they might lack of um, knowledge, or they don't have the, um, the talents in the company to, to support them. So, so I said that language is also like, because as you said, to tell them that uh, uh, global issue, they, they will think that this is too far away from them. Why I need to take uh, look into the global issues because I'm a small company. I have 20 people, 30 people. Maybe this is quite far away from me. So any incentive or any benefits after I do that. So they might be thinking about that before they take actions. So even they take actions, they don't have the way to follow. So, so the language is also the local people are speaking Cantonese or so um, if you, your provider is English and professional terms. So maybe it's hard for them to understand. So they were afraid to attend uh, your training or your workshops. So it is also, uh, yes, mm. what I said before. Okay, okay, thank you, Ophelia. Um, Raymond and, and Albert, maybe I'll start with Raymond first. Um, I'm sure Swire also work with your supply chain partners a lot, and some of them are SMEs. Have you encountered the kind of problems that Ophelia just mentioned? Or can you share your experience um, of working with SME partners uh, and to, you know, to co-learn as to how to you know, decarbonize and become climate ready? Well, um, probably the, one of the most recent experience uh, that we encounter SME in our uh, investment portfolios, uh, not necessarily related to uh, decarbonize, but mm. with resources and circular economy, mm. Mm. which is to do with the waste management. Okay. Uh, because uh, we got some um, uh, uh, food and beverage restaurants or even supermarket and other uh, uh, offices uh, outlet in our premises that they will generate uh, waste, right? Mm. With the upcoming of the municipal waste charging, People are concerning about the implication to their business. So we, 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 we as a developers uh, or landlord responsible for a retail outlet, for instance, we have the responsibility, understanding the implication of making the um, collection of the waste more effectively, and what would be the cost implication to 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 our tenant in some way or another, and also hopefully engage them to understand. How should they consider uh, the free hour, for example, reduction and so on and so forth? Mm. So we, 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 we come up with a kind of um, sort of a story uh, to cohort our tenant, uh, irrespective of the uh, trades, mm. to let them know the implication of the municipal waste charging and also how you can help to start uh, sorting out your ways, uh, reduce, and then eventually, if it's to do with this, then how you help to collect the waste to the central sorting out collection that we specially organize for the tenants and so on. So it took us uh, a while, but however, the journey was uh, experience was tremendous because our tenants understand we care about what they also care, but yeah. they might not have an idea how they can play a role mm. in addressing this. So by engaging these kinds of things, it's pretty fruitful. Mm. And so the, we also use this as a test bed in informing the government using this as a pilot, what would the implication, whether we use the weight or just a, a rubbish bag 
as the future charging mechanism. Mm -hmm. So we learned through this process to inform the government that significant help to reduce the burden on the uh, irrespective of whether large or corp uh, corporation or SME mm -hmm. happen to our tenant, right? Mm -hmm. That is one's most very useful experience that we encounter. We always try to do that. But uh, on, on others, more directly with um, uh, helping the SME into making more crime ready, we, we, we find it is a very important differentiator to us as the landlord mm. to make our business more customer centric, okay. understanding what exactly they need. Mm. Uh, then uh, we came up with a series of initiatives just to cite a few, for example, we offer free energy audit to whoever tenants who wish us to help them to understand their energy usages. So, so we have our own uh, colleagues going to the uh, outlet to really look at um, the electricity bill and the system operation and make suggestions uh, uh, on the EMO and so on. Right. Now you begin to have more of this soft service offered by CLP or Hong Kong Electric Company, but we have been doing it for many years now. Mm. And over time, we have achieved 9 million kilowatt hour saving among our tenants and, and covering uh, in excess of 5 million square foot mm. tenant space over the years, right? So, so, but however, we can do for all tenants, but it, it, it also demanding a lot of resources. Mm -hmm. So quite often, uh, we, uh, we want uh, to engage the like-minded tenant that they are immediate, they understand the benefit rather than having to sit down, spend a lot of time persuading them to do. But obviously, if someone who really find it useful, we would spend time trying to encourage them doing so. But, but we need to really understand the resources, mm. the aspect on that. Sure. Second is, um, because particularly in 2019 or even happened earlier than that, there's a change of climate, uh, the tenant mix in our retail uh, 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 portfolio. Mm. Uh, and uh, we started to have more F&B so we, we came up with an initiative uh, encouraging the new F&B or existing F&B to designing better green kitchen mm. using less energy. So we work out a checklist, both management aspect and also system design and also equipment selection. But a draw on the EMSD, the government list, right, on, in terms of equipment. Then we lay out in such a way that with Pond system, uh, giving out to our uh, incoming tenants uh, of restaurants. Now, try the best to follow these suggestions and see what you can do and improve, uh, in, in particular selection of refrigeration mm. or the kitchen extract system, or even looking into how the environment should be designed, uh, creating better environment for the chef and people working in preparing the food. For example, looking closer to your uh, air conditioning diffuser so the chef is working on the work can actually feel cooler. And so we, we, we make suggestions. Okay. So we find our, our tenant was, was find, find that it's really useful. And now we're beginning to have a lot of our restaurants uh, uh, tenants joining into a scheme, mm. both in mm. Chinese mainland and Hong Kong. One re example in China was one of the outlets happened to have one single outlet in one of our shops. Follow this, they reduce the energy and water consumption. They told us to reduce it. Uh, a, a lot of percentage. And then she decided to roll it out to all the outlets in, across in Chinese mainland. Of course, they are not happen to be recited in our, in our portfolio, but, yep. but that is something that we they find useful. So uh, another one is uh, more recently tenant. We, we find um, engaging the office tenant in saving energy. We need to understand, let them know how much they spend and then see whether there's an opportunity for them to reduce energy. So we install free of charge uh, on some like-minded tenants, um, office tenants, the tenant power metering. So we advise them when they do the fit out, how to measure the uh, energy use uh, on the outlaying circuit uh, in a way that they could themselves in the future understand to, uh, or having the opportunity to do gamification because they like to engage their own staff in saying competing one another business unit. Oh, you spend more energy than mine. Why does it happen? So we designed it in a particular way that not just getting the hardcore electricity and uh, bill consumption, but mm. also giving them uh, opportunity to compete among themselves. We also let them to compete among our other tenants if that happened to be feasible. 
So, so we, we find engaging our tenants is a very important journey in the whole uh, decarbonization because under the science-based target that you committed to, it's not only our scope one and two, which is within a direct control, that need to be uh, looked into, but also the scope three. So as part of it, we look at the lease asset, which counts uh, the tenant consumption being one of the important areas. So that also another driver, mm. picking us having to uh, look into that, aside from the fact that we are a service industry in terms of tenant. So we need to be more uh, customer centric here. So yes, it is an area that needs a lot of attention, indeed a lot of effort, and, mm. and but, but this is an enjoyable journey because mm. we, we, we buy in a lot of um, uh, um, tenants who, who, who like this, share with us, and committed to continue the lease. I think that is the best opportunity as far as we can see. Okay, as well. well, thank you, Raymond. Um, Albert, do you have similar experience working with your supply chain partners um, that you would like to share? Oh, yes, because well, um, we are installed lift and escalators, and they means mm. we have to uh, employ the, um, the vendors to fabricate all the equipment and uh, invite um, the subcontractors to carry installation as well. So, but uh, we have um, uh, what we call the uh, partnering systems. Mm. That means we will select um, some of them, then they work as a partner. And then um, uh, and, uh, we limited the numbers of vendors or subcontractors in order to build a strong relations with them. And then uh, um, we will encourage them um, to uh, invest in the um, decommunization process and also we will um, uh, finance and we will technically assist them to develop the uh, advanced production process. Mm. And also um, uh, the last but not least, we will uh, uh, reveal with them on the performance as well because we will have the, what we call the second party audit mm. on, on actually what the, um, the, the decomposition uh, process uh, performance and stuff things then. And then after that, we will have um, a scorecard. And then uh, by the end of the day, if he have a high score, then he will have more resources on carrying out these kind of things uh, as our support. OK. Um, thank you, Albert. Now, uh, I'm mindful of time. I think we still have um, eight minutes for this uh, panel. Um, Pratima, I want to ask you a question about climate transparency. So what's your take um, you know, uh, for Hong Kong companies? How are they performing? And how do you think they can do better in terms of disclosure and sharing information and communicating information? Yeah, I think just to touch upon Raymond and uh, mm. Albert's uh, point before as well, I think one of the things that we have also found is when companies really, especially the large multinationals, really um, communicate the message to suppliers, it has a, a huge difference. We had one telecommunications company I remember when they joined our supply chain program, um, you know, initially very ambitious, right? They've just set the science-based targets. They want all of their 2,000 suppliers to start responding to us. And, you know, we had to sort of temper the ambition a little bit. We had to say, you know, let's, let's pick the first 100 or 200 for you to start the engagement with so that it's tangible. Um, you know, the message gets across. And so, you know, we, we worked it on the basis of, you know, their targets and who is most sort of which of the suppliers would actually help in you know meeting these targets for their scope three mm. um, and after that you know we held a series of workshops where the company had you know one of their spokespersons always there to talk about their science-based targets what it is that they are aiming to do how the suppliers actually feature in those in those targets um, you know, what is, what is the level of incentivizations they're thinking of um, and, and, you know, how they want to progress from here. And I think that was probably one of the best examples I have in terms of uh, supply chain engagement um, because we had sort of, even although, you know, they were, in the first year itself, I would say they probably had almost a 90% response rate from their suppliers uh, for whom they had requested this information from. Mm. Um, but I think just coming back to the, your question um, on Hong Kong and, and transparency. So in 2020, uh, and we hold our disclosure cycle annually. So in 2020, you know, we, um, we saw 20% growth despite the pandemic on the number of companies that start, started responding on their climate disclosure. 
Um, I would say Hong Kong was pretty much on the same trajectory. We had about 25%. Mm. Um, and a lot of this actually uh, kind of comes from, you know, the, the central bank uh, announcements that came through. You know, if you, if you look at um, all of the Pacific from 2019 onwards, um, you had uh, HKMA, you had Monetary Authority of Singapore, you had People's Bank of China, um, you know, Malaysia Bank, um, Negara. They, they've all come out very, very strongly in favor of uh, TCFD and the People's Bank of China and the Monetary Authority of Singapore especially are on the steering committee of network for greening the financial system. So um, the central bank focus is really there. Um, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, in their ESG guidelines in 2020, uh, they've started to prepare companies to respond under the TCFD. So you know, they've, they've taken certain components of the TCFD and included that within the ESG guidelines. So that's also started to come through. Mm. Um, so we, we expect the, the uptake to be, um, you know, quite strong from now on. Um, you know, can it get better? Yes. Uh, can the ambition get better? Of course. Uh, I think one of the things that I would sort of really like to put it forward to the Hong Kong companies is when we look at, you know, there's what we call as the, the journey from climate resilience to decarbonization, right? And the, the, the climate resilience sort of comes from the TCFD reporting. And, you know, most people kind of think of TCFD report as something that you communicate to your investors. I think people don't realize that the TCFD report is a strategy document. It, it fits with your enterprise risk management framework. Um, you know, you can take your enterprise risk management framework and look at governance and culture. You can look at, um, you know, uh, strategy and objectives. You can look at performance. And each of the components of TCFD fits right into that um, with a climate lens. So it's not, it's not something that's brand new. Mm. Uh, it's, just, it's just ensuring that this fits in well and you've thought of this aspect of risk and opportunity to your business. Um, so I think once companies start getting on that journey and realize this is really what it is for, mm. um, the metrics and targets then start focusing a lot more on decarbonization and that then starts linking very nicely with science-based targets. Mm. Um, and so I think, I think that's probably where um, we will see more ambition coming through. Uh, and, and you know, within Asia Pacific, I would say probably uh, Japan, Taiwan, India um, have been, uh, as markets have been, have been much more forthcoming, uh, but we should, we should probably see much more action through Hong Kong as well shortly. Okay, um, thank you, Pratima. Now, um, we are coming to the end of this panel. Um, I have two more minutes. I just want to bring the whole conversation back to um, the title of this conference. It's about business leadership. So, Sophie, I, I I'll give you the last word. Um, how do you think we can enhance um, you know, climate competence um, within business leaders, uh, including the board and, of course, the C-suites? You know, what would be your one or two tips, very briefly, before we end? Well, first of all, I would, like, I would encourage all companies to check against those four steps, ambition, action, advocacy, and accountability. All the examples mentioned today yes. fit in there. So it's a nice structure if yes. you like to go through that. Yes. Secondly, I think what's really needed is stronger representation of climate inside the board and inside the articles of incorporation. So B Corporation, for example, has as an example, how do you incorporate that in your articles of incorporation? Mm -hmm. And we see more and more investors asking companies to nominate board members who have an understanding of climate risks and how to respond to that. Mm -hmm. I would love to see that Asian companies lead the way. And from what I see on the panel, I think you have a very good um, experience and insights already so I, I would encourage to see that BEC in Hong Kong works with its members to see how can we make that happen follow those four steps in your programs and really look at the board and articles of corporation to fundamentally change companies in a direction where we get to climate neutrality okay um thank you thank you Sophie thank you so much for joining us from Amsterdam I think um, you know your, your your remarks very nicely sum up you know what we really want to highlight with this conference um, about business leadership, about priorities, about being focused and committed, and work together to collaborate. 
with your four steps, of course, ambition is very important. But without action, without advocacy, and without accountability, we're going nowhere. Now with that, um, please give it up for all our panelists and Sophie from Amsterdam for one last time. Thank you. And I will hand it over to Mark. Thank you, Mark.